Now, I'd like to start by giving you a talk on laughter and how it's used in American foreign policy. I don't call it that in the title because <laughs> people won't come. But um, I'm going to give you an example of actually an incredibly important use of laughter in a very difficult international political situation. It's back in the 90s. There's the conflict in Yugoslavia. There is a lot of um, discomfort in, in USSR, former USSR, about its involvement. And there have been a series of rather ill-tempered meetings between Boris Yeltsin and other foreign powers. And he was in the US for a meeting with Bill Clinton. And there was a press conference afterwards. And I'm going to show you a clip from the press conference. And I want you to watch out at the top for three things. First of all, laughter is contagious. If you want people to laugh, get them laughing, and laughter will spread and it will increase. See how that happens in, the in this, what's about to unfold. Two other things. Watch Bill Clinton. He is looking for a reason to laugh. And the reason he finds is his name is mentioned. And he uses that as a reason to laugh. And then he uses a stand-up comedy technique called topping, which once you've got the laughter going, you keep it going by, keep by saying other things. So here we go statement yesterday in the United Translate Nations, speaking. and if you looked at the press reports, one could see that what you were writing was that today's meeting with President Bill Clinton was going to be a disaster. Big laugh again. Well, now for the first time I can tell you that you're a disaster. <laughs> Yeltsin's laughing. Are you sure you get the right attribution there? There's your topper. How briefly things just get completely derailed. Well, it's interesting. It's often shown nowadays. If you go to find this on YouTube, it'll be, oh, look at this hilarious blooper when Bill Clinton just started giggling. It's absolutely deliberate. It's one of the most careful uses and most successful uses of laughter I think probably we've ever seen that happened to be captured on film from such a high-status politician. What is actually going on there? Why did the laughter work? And what was Bill Clinton doing to ensure that it worked? Well, he was actually leaning on quite a few very basic aspects of laughter, sometimes which can be quite um, not obvious to us. And that's because when we think about laughter as humans, we think about jokes and we think about comedy. That's what we think laughter is. But actually, laughter is primarily a social emotion. It's an emotion that we express with incredible frequency when we're around other people. So you're 30 times more likely to laugh when there is somebody else with you than if you're on your own. And you'll laugh more if you know those people, and you'll laugh more if you like those people. That's because it literally lives in social spaces. It is a social emotion. We do laugh on our own, but it's so much more likely to happen with other people. And within those contexts, we're laughing very often, actually, as part of the interaction that we're having. We're not just kind of broadcasting laughter at each other. So here's an example of two friends who've come in to do, take part in a study in my lab. Not the most fun. So all that's happening here is the experimenters okay. explaining what's going to happen. They know they're being filmed. Look how often they're smiling and laughing. So then I just see both of you. Quite often, exactly the same time. Um, yeah, and in a good. second, she's going to leave the room and I'll look at how they use laughter then. Five minutes. So they're watching her. I'll, in a second, they'll look I'll at each other and back. both smile. So, uh, just perfect simul simultaneity there on the smiling. And again then. And she's about to leave. This is a weird situation. Coming into a lab to do an experiment okay. is odd. People are a little bit tense. Look how they react. Door is closed. A big laugh between the two of them. And that's because... In these interactions, these social interactions we're having with other people, most of the time when we laugh, we're actually laughing for largely communicative reasons. We're laughing to share emotions and express emotions that tell people something about what's going on in the interaction. So we will laugh to show that we are fond of the people that we're with. We will laugh to show affection. We will laugh to show affiliation. We will laugh to show we're part of the same group as people. We will use laughter to indicate that we are playing 
Playful behaviour is incredibly important to humans, particularly when they're infants, but in fact throughout our whole lives. And one of the reasons for that is play is an ancient mammal behaviour. We are not the only animal that plays. All mammals play when they're juveniles. Some mammals, like humans and otters and dogs, play their whole lives. And one of the ways that we use laughter, particularly this is very obvious when you look at other primates, is actually we use laughter to indicate that we are playing. So what could be just a violent act <laughs> becomes a playful act because you're using the laughter to show this is a game. I'm not going to hurt you. I'm not going to kill you. I'm not going to do anything threatening. This is fun. We are playing. With laughter, it can be used as an invitation to play. Come on, join in. Let's have fun here. Let's do this. Let's change the mood. And in fact, if you look at humans and how they use laughter, they will use laughter very commonly as a way of de-escalating a stressful situation and using the laughter to improve everybody's mood. It's an unbelievably effective tool for this. And the really important part of this isn't just that laughter is a bit of magic sauce that kind of makes everything better. It only works if everybody laughs. And when you laugh, you seem to be able to regulate emotions in a way that improves a mood, particularly in a stressful situation, and makes everybody feel better. It makes difficult situations more happy situations. And that, of course, is an extremely important function of laughter. So people will use laughter in situations where you might imagine they might be cross. <laughs> like, here I am at work, and hilariously you've thrown yellow paint all over me because we're having that kind of day. And he's laughing to show he's OK. He could get angry. He could be upset. He could say, shut up now, that's enough. No. The laughter is shared, and it's, it's playing the role here. That's it's doing its job. It's working. So we're building on this sort of straightforward ancient mammal behavior for demonstrating play, inviting to play. We've kind of built up into this extraordinarily complex behavior, which we use communicatively to show affection, to show we understand people, to show we agree people, we recognize what they're saying, but also to regulate the emotional state of the group of people that we're it with and to try and make things better. Now, there are other ways you can regulate emotions. You can regulate emotions by threatening everybody or frightening everybody. Laughter's taking you in a different kind of direction. I think it's very interesting, scientifically, how completely, totally we have ignored laughter. If I go into Web of Science, which is the major sort of database for published papers, and I put in the, the terms emotion, expression, fear, I'll get back mm, about 6,000 papers. If I put in the term emotion, expression, laughter, I'll get back about 150 papers. There just is not a great deal of research into laughter. And it's interesting if you look at the roots of where all this comes from, because most of the work that we do in emotion in my field of psychology and neuroscience builds on the work of Charles Darwin. Now, Charles Darwin wrote a really beautiful book about emotions in humans in other animals. And in that, he's kind of the first person to set out the idea that actually some, not all, but some of the emotions we experience actually have an older evolutionary history. So anger in a human and anger in a dog might share some features in common. He wrote about lots of emotions and all the negative emotions he wrote about, fear, anger, disgust, sadness, we carried on researching for the next 150 years. He also talked a lot about laughter, and we pretty much ignored that. So he, laughter, Darwin thought, at its heart, was an expression of joy. It's a joyful behavior, and that's kind of capturing the nature of play. Play is a joyful behavior. If everything else is equal, children will play. If children feel safe and comfortable, and they don't, they're not being made to do something else, children will play. It's like a default state. And laughter maybe is a kind of default joyful state for normal human interactions even when we grow up. But how do we get there? Well, we need to learn how to use it. This is just a study that we did at the Science Museum, and the only important thing you need know to know about this is we asked a lot of people what laughter sounded like. We had, well, we had nearly 2,000 people, and this is the age range of the participants along the bottom. We're testing children from the age of three and upwards. And what we're doing is we're playing them different kinds of laughter, and we're saying, does that laughter sound like that person's helplessly laughing, spontaneous laughter, or is that communicative laughter? Is that someone laughing in a conversation? But they do sound quite different. Children don't know what you're talking about. They hear laughter. As we get older, you can see that blue line is everybody getting better quite quickly at spotting that spontaneous, helpful laugh. You think of the last time you were laughing and you could not stop that spontaneous laughter. But actually, the red line is showing how people improve at recognizing this communicative use of laughter. And actually, we are not peaking in our performance at this until we start to get into our late 30s. And that's because we have to learn about laughter in social situations. No one can tell you. You cannot read a book 
the only place you learn about how to use laughter and all of the things that you can do with laughter is in interactions with people. The other so psychological phenomena that have this kind of trajectory where you don't see peak performance until people are in approaching middle age are social skills. They're things like empathy, theory of mind. Now, that suggests that actually we should think about this social use of laughter and using laughter in this kind of rich, complex way as something that really is a very important social skill, and I think you could see that with Bill Clinton. What happens when this goes wrong? I did a study a couple of years ago with some colleagues at UCL who were very interested in the sort of developmental risk factors that mean that you might have serious problems with your emotion regulation as an adult. So they did this study with boys who are teenagers and who are at risk of psychopathy. That means they have two sets of traits. They have conduct disorders, so they are poorly behaved. They behave aggressively, they behave in a criminal way. And they have another characteristic, which is they are high in callous and unemotional traits. What this means in shorthand is these boys behave badly and they do not care if they hurt you. Now, they're being compared here to boys who have conduct disorders but who do feel bad if they hurt you and normally developing boys. And this is the brain system that's lit up when you hear laughter at all. So you can see there's auditory processing. You can see the social meaning of laughter is getting through. Within this, we found very selective activation that was reduced in the boys at risk of psychopathy in areas here and here, which are to do with contagion. They don't show that priming response when they hear laughter at all. And if you ask them... They do not find laughter as contagious. Now, think what that means for their social interactions. They're not joining in when people laugh. They're not learning how to understand laughter. When they hear someone laughing when they're older, they may misreact and think they're being laughed at. So all of this kind of difficulty built in. Laughter is sticky. We showed in a study last year that if you add laughter onto very bad jokes, what's orange and sounds like a parrot, a carrot... People think the joke is funnier if you add laughter to it, even though you're asking them to rate how funny the joke is. It kind of sticks to things around you. And it's incredibly interesting, actually, how you look at people using laughter in the workplace. There's now a growing literature showing that in high-stress occupations where people need to work as a team, like the police, like nurses, like medics, like people in the fire service, what you find is that they use jokes in a very profession-specific way. They often have quite dark senses of humour, and that's doing three things. It's excluding people who are not part of their group, it is helping them deal with the stress, and it's helping them bond. It's coming back to this role of laughter as a way of creating and making social bonds, reinforcing that group behaviour. Now, what this means in practice, I think, is actually most jobs require people working in a team. Most jobs have moments of stress. We could learn a lot from thinking about this. And in fact, if we go back to that video of Bill Clinton, what you can see, as I press the wrong button, is that actually he was using almost everything I talked about here. He uses contagion to get the laughter going. He laughs, the laughter spreads. At first, it doesn't get Yeltsin in, but it gets everybody else in, and then it starts to work on Yeltsin. He uses straightforward recognition just as a reason to laugh. Oh, that is my name. Ha, 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 ha. And then, when there's a comment about things that will be a disaster, he starts really laughing, and he uses a topper to keep it going. But he's really, really careful with the laughter. He does some other things as well. He's clearly kind of showing, this is fine, this is... a anticipated to be a difficult situation, it becomes a less stressed situation because it's not an angry man shouting at everybody. This is funny. This is hilarious. He sends out that invitation to play and people join in. And the other thing that he's doing there is he's showing great affection. He's very careful to show that he's laughing with Boris Yeltsin. This guy is hilarious. He's not going, that guy is an idiot, let's laugh at him. So, in fact, all the way across the board here, at almost every possible level, he's using laughter in this really nuanced way. And, in fact, this is something that we're all doing or have some understanding of. And it's really worth taking this seriously. Things like this get called bloopers. We think of a laughter session or comedy as being light relief or breaking the ice. But, actually, those situations where people are just playing, when there's just fun happening, the places where laughter happens, that's when the real emotional and social work of a team is occurring. That's where we're making and maintaining these social bonds. That's where we're getting closer to each other. So sometimes, although it feels like a bit of fun, it really is worth listening to your laughter and taking that laughter very seriously indeed. Thank you.